Chapter 3, Part 3 of Biographical Notice of Niccolo Paganini by Francois Joseph Fatis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3, Niccolo Paganini, Part 3 with a people so imaginative as the italians so extraordinary a looking person as paganini his wondrous talent and the eccentricity of his mode of life naturally conduced to superstitious ideas and the belief in the supernatural many believed he had entered into a compact with the devil in germany these prejudices were greater even than among the italians it has been seen in his letter already given what was said of him at vienna when he played his variations on the witch's dance at leipzig the zeitung für die elegante welt gave the following account of one of his concerts in the hotel de pallone resided a lady of exceeding beauty whose tresses were the object of much admiration but whose features wore an aspect of deep melancholy though a sweet yet sad smile was ever playing on her lips i had seen her once this sufficed to imprint her features upon my memory and i sought every means to see her at all times the evening paganini gave his last concert i was near the stage and although my eye wandered all over the theatre i did not discover her i sought so anxiously paganini appeared can i describe the magic of his bow the marvellous tones he extracted from the melancholy and plaintive g-string touched every heart and upon this occasion more so than i ever remember at this moment the sound of a sigh such as proceeds from some person dying struck upon my ear i looked around and saw my incognita white as marble unconscious apparently of the tears which fell in showers down her cheeks i uttered a cry of surprise which was heard throughout the theatre every voice being at the time hushed into silence paganini who was only a few paces from me turned round and looked at me an extraordinary smile such as i had never before seen played upon his face and it did not seem either intended for me or the lady i watched its direction and perceived not without emotion dressed in the english fashion and seated next the lady my not very reputable acquaintance of el Bengarag, who returned the smile with one no less extraordinary they were then intimate i understand that smile now in reality it had been generally observed and for a long time surmised that paganini and satan were most intimately connected or that they were one and the same person my discovery made me forget my lady but judge of my horror when upon turning round i saw her neighbour take her hand squeeze it with affection and the lady grow paler than before i was thunderstruck but at this moment the applause increased paganini had finished playing the audience rose as did the lady and her friend i followed them to the door before which stood a carriage with two black horses the lady got in followed by her cavalier when the carriage flew off bright flashes of lightning bursting from the horse's eyes greatly agitated i returned to the theatre but paganini's marvels no longer astounded me the concert concluded i left by the same door through which the mysterious lady had passed and then found there was no place where a carriage could stand paganini was deeply affected by these rumours which not only detracted from his position but tended to render his talent valueless it is not improbable that in his youth he had himself contributed to the propagation of such fabrications by his eccentricities but when age crept in when honours and successes had accumulated he discovered that none however great his fame however favoured by fortune could be great when general esteem is withheld with the view of ending the ridiculous reports concerning his origin he published at prague the following letter which his mother had written to him on the twenty first of july eighteen twenty eight dearest son at last after seven months have elapsed since i wrote to you at milan i had the happiness of receiving your letter of the ninth current 
through the intermediary of signor agnini and was much rejoiced to find that you were in the enjoyment of good health i am also delighted to find that after your travels to paris and london you purpose visiting genuine expressly to embrace me i assure you my prayers are daily offered up to the most high that my health may be sustained also yours so that my desire may be realized my dream has been fulfilled and that which god promised me has been accomplished your name is great and art with the help of god has placed you in a position of independence beloved esteemed by your fellow citizens you will find in my bosom and those of your friends that repose which your health demands the portraits which accompanied your letter have given me great pleasure i had seen in the papers all the accounts you give me of yourself you may imagine as your mother what an infinite source of joy it was to me dear son i entreat you to continue to inform me of all that concerns you for with this assurance i shall feel that it will prolong my days and be convinced that i shall still have the happiness of embracing you we are all well in the name of all your relations i thank you for the sums of money you have sent omit nothing that will render your name immortal eschew the vices of great cities remembering that you have a mother who loves you affectionately and whose fondest aspirations are your health and happiness she will never cease her supplications to the all-powerful for your preservation embrace your amiable companion for me and kiss little achille love me as i love you your ever affectionate mother teresa paganini this letter was not necessary to prove to reasoning mortals that the great artist was not a son of satan but the ignorant mass listens not to reason nor are its superstitious beliefs easily removed opinion in france did justice to these follies but they seemed to revive afterwards and acquired renewed strength after the decease of him who had been so calumniated during his life nothing could have been more variable than the moral dispositions of paganini at one time melancholy and taciturn passing several hours seated without uttering a word at another he would give himself entirely up to unrestrained gaiety without any apparent motive for either the one or the other he seldom spoke much but while travelling the movement of the carriage rendered him loquacious mr george harris who lived for some time on terms of intimacy with him and who has published some curious details on his private life states that his bad health rendered his speaking aloud extremely painful but when the noise of the wheels rattled over the stones was almost deafening he spoke loudly and rapidly it was not as with most persons the beauty of the country through which he passed that made him communicative for he paid no attention to the lovely landscape which met his eye in every direction rapid transit seemed to be his only aim but there was something in the rolling of the coach which made conversation a necessity his constant suffering did not permit him to enjoy a beautiful country where others dwelt who were blessed with health besides he was always cold and even at a summer heat of twenty-two degrees he wrapped his large cloak around him and ensconced himself in a corner of a carriage with the windows hermetically closed by a singular contradiction he invariably kept all the windows of his apartments wide open to take as he called it an air bath he cursed the climate of germany of france and above all of england saying there was no living but in italy travelling was exceedingly painful to him suffering as he constantly did from pain in the abdomen hence his wish to travel quickly in the agony he experienced his habitual paleness was replaced by a livid and greenish hue sleep to him was a source of great delight and he would sleep uninterruptedly for two or three hours consecutively and awake full of cheerfulness when the horses were being changed he either remained in the carriage or walked about until the fresh horses were put to but he never entered an inn or post-house until he arrived at the end of his journey before starting he neither took tea nor coffee but a basin of soup or a cup of chocolate 
if he started early in the morning he would do so fasting and frequently remained nearly the whole day without taking any refreshment his luggage caused no trouble as it consisted only of a small dilapidated trunk containing his precious guaneri violin his jewels his money and a few fine linen articles a carpet bag and a hat case which was placed in the interior of the carriage careless of all that related to the comforts of life he was alike negligent in his toilette a small napkin would contain his entire wardrobe his papers which were of paramount importance representing immense value he kept in a small red pocket-book which also contained his accounts none but himself could decipher these hieroglyphics of his babel-like accounts where pell-mell were mixed up vienna and karlsruhe berlin frankfurt and leipzig receipts and outlay for post-horses etc and concert tickets all was clear to him though extremely ignorant of arithmetic he had devised certain means of arriving at an exact account of all his affairs in the inns on the road paganini was never dissatisfied it was a matter of indifference to him whether he was shown into a garret or an elegantly furnished chamber whether the bed was good or bad as long as he was removed from all noise i have enough noise in large towns he would say i wish to rest on the road his supper was always extremely light frequently he would take nothing but a cupful of chamomile tea after which he would sleep soundly till the morning however when about fifteen years before his death he was attacked with the phthisis which ultimately proved fatal a convulsive cough frequently interrupted his sleep but as soon as the crisis was over he was asleep again the most securely guarded state prisoner never experienced so monotonous a course of existence as that to which paganini condemned himself at home he left his room with regret and only seemed happy in perfect solitude many have thought his violin occupied him constantly never was error greater he never touched it except to tune it previously to going to a rehearsal or a concert i have labored enough to acquire my talent he would say it is time i should rest myself the anecdote is perhaps known of an englishman a passionate admirer and amateur of the violin who intent on discovering the secret of the great artist's study followed in his steps for more than six months staying at the same hotels and always when possible in the next room vainly however did he seek to hear him study some of his difficulties the most profound silence reigned in the artist's apartment it occurred however that on one occasion the rooms of the amateur and the artist were only separated by a door which was not used peeping through the keyhole the curiosity of the amateur was as it appeared about to be gratified he saw paganini seated on a sofa taking from its case the precious violin which on being raised to his shoulder assured him his long-sought happiness was about to be realized but not a note was heard for paganini merely moved his left hand up and down the fingerboard to calculate certain positions without using the bow this done the violin was replaced in its case in utter despair the englishman gave up the fruitless pursuit and returned to england paganini did not seek to conceal that his constant study of the instrument in his early years precluded his attending to his education and that his mind was but ill stored with literary instruction he never looked into a book not even to while away any portion of time by reading a romance history and the sciences were sealed books to him m schottky notwithstanding found among the documents which were furnished to him by m amate an anecdote which indicates that the great violinist's memory retained certain smatterings of history mythology and poetry which he would apply occasionally most oppositely dining one day with the celebrated poets monti and ugo foscolo at the residence of the beautiful rich and witty contessa of s foscolo who was captivated with the charms of the contessa arrived at last and finding monti his rival addressing her in terms of gallantry he abruptly quitted the apartment and hastened to allay his fierceness on the garden terrace 
here he met paganini and his passion subsided approaching him with great warmth and seizing his hand he said to him when i heard you at the concert yesterday homer stood before me in all his sublimity the grandeur of the first movement of your concerto brought to my mind the arrival of the greek ships before troy the exquisite loveliness of the adagio pictured to me the tender love talk of achilles and brisis when will you let me hear the despair and wailings of the hero over the body of patroclus paganini smiled without hesitation when achilles paganini finds his patroclus among violinists political events had no interest for him he consequently never read a newspaper unless it contained something concerning himself his whole thoughts were occupied on projects for the future among these were the founding of a musical conservatory in italy the publication of his compositions the writing of operas and abandoning his professional tours while dwelling on these subjects he would pace his room with great rapidity arrange his stray pieces of music or number his red diary dress himself and go to dinner or have it brought to his room which he preferred to the table d'hote he spent a great portion of the day reclining on his bed and left his room only in the evening to walk for about an hour he would pass the entire evening without light in his apartment and rarely went to bed later than half-past ten he frequently remained for hours absorbed in deep thought almost motionless mistrustful like most italians he complained of the treachery of some of his most intimate friends which necessarily rendered him the more so hence his dislike to society he did not believe he could repose the slightest confidence in any one notwithstanding his extreme repugnance to receiving visits his world-wide fame brought sometimes from sixty to eighty visitors anxious to see and speak with him many of these he would refer to his secretary but others he could not avoid receiving circumspect with those who came on business he was more so with artists who came to discover the secret of his talent he listened to these patiently his fatigue was so great after receiving these visits that he would bolt his door and not answer any one who knocked the invitations he received for dinners and suppers were very numerous in all the towns he visited or remained in to give concerts they annoyed him and he refused most of them aware of his habit of partaking of everything that was placed on the table he could eat and drink largely without feeling any ill effects at the time but in a day or two his intestinal pains would come on with redoubled force he would invariably if he could do so without being observed retire to rest as soon as he left the table he was infinitely gayer previous to dinner than after one would be inclined to suppose he was desirous of impressing upon his host the sacrifice he made in accepting the invitation it was so in fact at evening parties he was extremely cheerful if no mention was made of music but if with the ill-judged view of affording him amusement it was proposed or spoken of his spirits immediately left him if to gather his opinions upon other violinists or to question him upon his talent he only replied monosyllabically and endeavoured to avoid the inquisition by stealing away to another part of the room or to interrupt the conversation by observations on other subjects in the large cities of germany vocal and instrumental societies deemed it a homage to his talent to perform before him some musical compositions but although he would appear to listen with attention his mind was preoccupied on other subjects and he rarely knew what he listened to he occasionally avowed with great sincerity that the obligation of identifying his public existence with music made him feel an imperious desire to forget the art when he entered into ordinary life nor can it be dissimulated that this idiosyncrasy pertains to almost every artist who has obtained great celebrity and who has acquired popular fame with these all their faculties are concentrated in the feeling of their personality art separated from their own glorification does not exist 
gluck and Gretti recognized no music but their own nor believed any other to be worthy of being performed how many composers have been imbued with the same feeling differing with those great men only in dissimulation with those whose executive talents bring them in contact with the public it is worse still without personal ovations it is not only indifference for the art it is hatred hence when having returned to the ordinary conditions of life and withdrawn from the manifestations of enthusiasm they have for so long a period excited artists who come into this category decline rapidly and present in their old age a spectacle of moral degradation unless by an extraordinary exception great intellectual faculties have been united to their extraordinary talent paganini felt great pleasure in a small circle of friends and in quiet conversation the amusements of society delighted him and he would remain until a late hour where he did not appear to be an object of attention he did not like the glare of light his sight having been affected by stage lights hence his habit of playing with his back to the lights and of remaining in the dark when at home his memory was excellent despite his habitual abstraction when once persons had been introduced to him their features and names were never forgotten but by some inexplicable singularity he never remembered the name of a town in which he gave concerts the moment he left it notwithstanding the enormous number of concerts he gave paganini was preoccupied the day on which one was given he would remain idle the whole morning lying on a sofa before going to a rehearsal he would open his violin case to examine the state of his strings tune it and prepare the orchestral parts of the pieces he intended playing during these operations he took large quantities of snuff a certain token with him of great mental excitement and disquietude on arriving at rehearsal his first care was to see that no person was in the room or theatre should any one be there he merely indicated to the band what he desired by almost an imperceptible sound or slight pizzicato he was extremely severe with the band and would have a solo or a tutti repeated for the slightest error if this continued he would pace to and fro before the orchestra and dart the most furious looks at the musicians but when a tutti came in too soon before the termination of a cadenza he burst forth into a tempest of rage which would cause the boldest to tremble when however the accompaniment was satisfactory he would smile and express his approbation aloud in these words bravissimo siete tutti virtuosi when he came to a pause for the introduction of a cadenza the musicians all rose eager to observe what he was about to play but paganini would merely play a few notes stop suddenly and turning towards them would laughingly add etc messieurs it was only in the evening he would put forth all his strength after the rehearsal he would converse for a few moments with the leader to thank him for the attention that had been paid and sought out special passages for his particular observation he invariably carried away himself the orchestral parts of which he was particularly careful the principal part was never seen as he played from memory to avoid his pieces being copied when he returned home he partook of a light repast threw himself upon his bed and remained there until the carriage came to take him to the theatre a few minutes sufficed for his toilette and he proceeded at once to the concert when he arrived he evinced as much gaiety as he had displayed gravity during the day his first question was is there a large audience if answered in the affirmative he would say good good excellent people if on the contrary he was told the audience was small he expressed a fear that the effect of the music would be lost in the empty boxes paganini was not always alike disposed for his concerts he had doubts of himself and trying several difficult passages if he failed in executing them with his usual facility he became angry and exclaimed if i were in paris i would not play to-day he would frequently recover himself during the evening and say ingeniously to his friends i have played better at the end than at the commencement of the concert 
he kept the public waiting a long time before he came on his departure from the theatre resembled a triumph a crowd formed an avenue to his carriage and greeted him with loud acclamations he was received similarly on his arrival at his hotel paganini seemed delighted with the homage and frequently mixed with the crowds that surrounded the doors he would join the company of the table d'hote in the best possible spirits and would sup heartily there are few examples of such devotion to severe study as paganini evinced in the accomplishment of his art he created the difficulties he performed with a view of varying the effects and augmenting the resources of his instrument this as it is seen having been his object so soon as he was capable of reflecting on his ultimate destiny having played the music of the old masters particularly that of pugnani viotti and kreutzer he felt he could never attain great fame if he followed in their path chance brought under his notice the ninth work of locatelli entitled l'art di nuovo Magulizione and he at once saw in it a new world of ideas and facts though on its first appearance it was unsuccessful from its excessive difficulty and perhaps also because it was in advance of the period when classic form should be departed from circumstances were favourable to paganini for the necessity of innovation was at its zenith in his day in adopting the ideas of his predecessors in resuscitating forgotten effects in superadding what his genius and perseverance gave birth to he arrived at that distinctive character of performance and his ultimate greatness the diversity of sounds the different methods of tuning his instrument the frequent employment of double and single harmonic notes the simultaneous pizzicato and bow passages the various staccati the use of the double and even triple notes a prodigious facility in executing wide intervals with unerring precision joined to an extraordinary number of various styles of bowing such were the principal features of paganini's talent means which were rendered perfect by his execution his exquisite nervous sensibility and his enormous musical feeling from the manner in which he placed himself leaning as it were on his hip from the position of his right arm and the manner in which he held his bow it would have been thought its movements would be nothing less than awkward and the arm all stiffness but it was soon observed that the bow and the arm moved with equal ease and what appeared to be the result of some malformation was the result of deep study of that which was most favourable to the effect the artist wished to produce his bow was of ordinary dimensions but was screwed up with more than usual tension it is probable paganini found it preferable for his bounding staccato which differed from that of all other violinists in the notice which he wrote at lucca he says great surprise was manifested at the length of his bow and the thickness of his strings but some time after he evidently discovered the difficulty of producing vibration in every part of the strings and consequently of obtaining a perfect tone for he gradually diminished their dimensions and when he played in paris his strings were under the medium size paganini's hands were large dry and nervous his fingers by dint of excessive practice had acquired a suppleness and aptitude difficult to conceive the thumb of the left hand fell easily upon the palm of his hand when necessary for the execution of certain shifting passages the quality of tone which paganini brought from his instrument was clear and pure without being excessively full except in certain effects when it was manifest he collected all his power to arrive at extraordinary results but what most distinguished this portion of his talent was the variety of voices he drew from the strings by means of his own or which after having been discovered by others had been neglected their full import having been misunderstood thus the harmonic sounds which before his time had only been considered as curious and limited effects rather than as a positive benefit to a violinist formed an important feature in paganini's performance 
it was not only for an isolated effect that he employed them but as an artificial means to reach certain intervals which the largest hand could never embrace it was from the harmonic sounds that he obtained on the fourth string a compass of three octaves before paganini none had imagined that beyond natural harmonics it was possible to execute thirds fifths sixths in fact that at the octaves in diatonic succession natural and harmonic sounds could be produced all these paganini executed in every position with the utmost facility in singing he frequently produced a vibratory effect which greatly resembled the human voice but when by sliding the hand the voice became like that of an old woman the effect was affected and exaggerated paganini's intonation was perfect this rare quality was not the least of the advantages he possessed over other violinists after having spoken of the great qualities of paganini's talent it is necessary to consider it from the general impression it produced upon the public many overleap the bounds of reason in expatiating on the poetry of his playing particularly upon his singing he was cited as the great violin singer as the creator of a pathetic and dramatic school applied to the art of bowing i confess that i do not look at his prodigious talent in this light what i experienced in listening to him was astonishment unbounded admiration but i was seldom moved by that feeling which appears to me inseparable from the true expression of music the poetry of the great violinist consisted principally in his brilliancy and if i may be allowed the expression the mastery of his bow there was fullness and grandeur in his phrasing but there was no tenderness in his accents in the prayer from mose for example he was great when the baritone voice was heard on the fourth string from the elevated character he gave to it but when he came to the part of elsia an octave higher on the same string he fell into an affected strain of heavy tremulous sounds which good taste would have rejected his triumph was in the last major strain here he was sublime and he then left an impression bordering on enthusiasm to pronounce judgment upon paganini it was necessary to hear him in his own especial style that which most characterized his talent in his concerts in paris he thought it necessary to flatter the national feeling by playing a concerto by kreutzer and one by rode but he scarcely rose above mediocrity in their performance his secretary mr harris tells us the opinion paganini formed of himself as regards these attempts he said to him i have my own peculiar style in accordance with this i regulate my composition to play those of other artists i must arrange them accordingly i had much rather write a piece in which i can trust myself entirely to my own musical impressions the unfavorable impression he made in paris with these two pieces was a lesson to him he never played from that time any music but his own paganini's art did not apply to any species of composition his was a specialty of which he alone could be the interpreter an art born with him the secret of which he has carried with him to the grave i have used a word he often repeated for he frequently insisted that his talent resulted from a secret discovered by him and which he would reveal before his death in a study for the violin that should only contain a small number of pages but that would cause the utmost consternation to all violinists he cited in support of the infallibility of his secret the experiment that he had made at naples upon a violoncellist of little talent named gaetano Ciandelli, who by the revelation of the mystery became transformed in one morning into a virtuoso apart from the study of mechanism for which there is no substitute no secret can exist from talent but that which nature implants in the heart of the artist there is however something astounding and mysterious in the faculty which paganini possessed of invariably overcoming the almost unheard of difficulties without ever touching the violin except at concerts and rehearsals mr harris who was his secretary and did not leave him for more than a year never saw him take his violin from its case 
be it however as it may death has not permitted the secret of which paganini spoke to be divulged many notices of the life and talent of this great artist have been published either in collections or separately the most important are the following one paganini's leben und treiben als künstler and als mensch life and adventures of paganini as an artist and as a man prague calve eighteen thirty in octavo of four hundred and ten pages this work of which m schottky is the author is but a compilation without order of correspondence anecdotes and german newspaper reports as far as concerns the travels of the artist from his first leaving italy an abridgment of this work in which many doubtful facts and positive false accounts have been introduced was published by m l vanella under the title of paganini's leben und character life and character of paganini hamburg hoffmann and comp eighteen thirty in octavo two paganini in seinem reisewagen und zimmer in seinen redseligen stunden in gesellschaftlichen zirkeln und seinen konzerten paganini in his post chaise in his room in his hours of privacy in society and his concerts brunswick viveg eighteen thirty in octavo of sixty-eight pages a work written in simplicity and good faith indicating sound judgment mr george harris or harris the writer of this opusculum was an englishman attached to the court of hanover with a view of studying paganini as a man and an artist and to publish this notice he became his interpreter and secretary and remained with him an entire year three leben charakter und kunst paganini's eine schizze sketch of the life character and talent of paganini by m f c j schutz professor at hall leipzig rhein eighteen thirty in octavo four notice sur le celebre violiniste nicolo paganini by m j imbert de la Filet, paris Egiot in octavo of sixty-six pages with portrait five paganini his life his person and a few words upon his secret by g l anders paris delaunay eighteen thirty one in octavo six paganini et berio ou avis aux artistes qui se destinent à l'enseignement du violon by father Friol, paris languest eighteen thirty one in octavo seven vita di nicolo paganini di genova scritta et illustrata di giancarlo conestiboli socio di varie academie perugia tipografia di vincenzo bartelli eighteen thirty one one volume in octavo three hundred and seventeen pages an excellent work uh, carefully edited and in a good spirit of criticism from documents chosen with discernment the portrait of paganini is given from mr schottke's but softened and idealized independently of the portraits which accompany most of the above works many were published in italy in germany and in france the most sought for are the following first portrait of paganini lithographed by morin in the seventh volume of the revue musicale second one lithographed by mosesi in quarto paris bernard third milan ricordi fourth drawn and lithographed by bega berlin sox in quarto fifth without name of author in quarto berlin trautwein and company sixth drawn by hahn munich walter seventh lithographed by kretzmer leipzig bei confidentel eighth without name of author vienna artario eighteen twenty eight ninth ditto hamburg niemeyer tenth ditto leipzig pernicke eleventh ditto mannheim Eckel. end of chapter three part three